hello everyone how are you in this short video we're going to define different paths using parametric functions in previous video we talked about when you have a plane and the plane the length is defined by a number line called x and the width is going to be defined by a number line y in order to have a path x must be a function of a third parameter another this another a third parameter which in this case we call it the t and later on sometimes you call it theta sometimes you call it s but in here we said x is going to be a function of t means for a different t value your x is going to be a different and this one called the range of your path please don't get confused between the range of the path and the domain and the range of the function the range is how far that object going to travel parallel to the horizontal line and here your y is also function of t therefore in physics you have many paths and we only talk about few which they are extremely important number one is a linear path linear path could be horizontal could be vertical could be a slant a slant means going up or going down therefore you have horizontal you have vertical and you have a slant N another path which is an important which is very important is a circular path that's the circular path another path which we have we are using it a lot called projectile path then the projectile is nothing except a graph of a parabola because you have an initial fourth move the object along the x-axis and then you have an initial fourth move the object up but gravity at the same time gonna affect that object and it's gonna undo your initial fourth and at some point these two become the same then after that your initial fourth get less and less and the gravity become more <sighs> therefore here your gravity supersede your initial force but in this half your force superseding your gravity let's talk about the linear path x of t equal to t or x of t equal to t minus a one or I can say x of t equal to a t plus b, which example a can be any real numbers, b can be any real numbers. Therefore, if a become 2 and b become a negative 3, that's your x of t. And your y of t is always 0, that's the horizontal path, means when x is 0, your t is 0, x is at negative 3. When the t is 1, is negative 1. When the t is 2, is at x equal to 1. When the t is 3, is at x equal to 3, and so on. Therefore, this one called a horizontal path or a linear path. What happens if I make my x to become a zero but my y become a times t plus b 
which I'm going to say negative 3t minus 2. This is just an example, negative 3 for a, negative 2 for a b, but your x of t is 0. Here, when x is always going to be 0, but when the t is 0, you are at negative 2. When the t is 1, you are at negative 5. When the t is negative 3, I'm talking about 3 minutes before it becomes 9 minus 2, you were at 7. Therefore, this is called a vertical path. And some, somebody said, what is a slant? That x of t is a t plus b and y of t is c t plus d. Both of them are linear function. Example, you have x of t equal to 2t plus a 1, and y of t, this is a man-made example, negative 1t plus a 2. Therefore, here if I graph these, when the t is 0, you are 1 and 2. When the t is 1, you are at 3, 1, and one. Therefore, you see that become your slant path. Okay. Therefore, you know about the slant path. And somebody said, what happened if I want to take that slant path and change it to a Cartesian? You go in here and solve for t, which is x minus 1 over 2, and plug it for the y. Because remember, y depends on x. You can solve for t in here in a y function and plug it back for the x, but therefore x become independent and y become independent. Therefore, here y of x, right now is going to be function of x because t is going to remove. It is removing. Therefore, you have a negative 1 and x minus 1 over a 2 plus a 2 and if I solve for that one, your y of x is equal to negative x over a 2 plus a 1 over a 2 plus a 2, and that's negative 1 half x plus 5 half. And see, that's exactly my graph. Your y intercept is 5 half, and for every one unit, two unit go upward, you go one down. And that becomes the graph in a Cartesian. This is only a relationship between x and y. You cannot tell me how the orientation work because this one, it go from negative infinity to positive infinity. But sometimes in the parametric function, it depends how you assign number to the t. Your path go backward, the path go forward. And this is, they said, parametric function does give you always the path. And we said a pair of parametric equation plus the graph called plane curve. Next, talk about a circular path. A circular path is x of t equal to cosine of t. Because sine and cosine called circular function. Therefore, if t becomes 0, cosine of 0 is 1. And y of t is sine of t. And if t is 0, it becomes 1 and 0. When this becomes pi over 2, that becomes 0 and a 1. When this becomes a pi, that becomes negative 1 and a 0. And when this becomes 3 pi over 2, that becomes 0 and a negative 1. And you see, I have an orientation and I have a circular path. Somebody said, I know cosine correspond to x, but what happened if I make my sine correspond to x? In this case, you don't have to say sine correspond to x or um, cosine correspond to x or sine correspond to y. You can switch them because by switching, you're switching the orientation. When t is 0, you have 0 and a 1. 
When it's pi over 2, you get 1 and a 0. See, your orientation only changed, but still you get a unit circle. Well, somebody said, well, what happened if I make 2 sine of a t and a plus 1? Oh, I'm so confused. <laughs> and y of t become 2 cosine of t plus a 2. I said, don't worry about it. Solve for sine of t, then we can solve for t. Then sine of t is x minus 1 over a 2. And what is cosine t? Cosine t is y minus a 2 over a 2. Oh, I don't have to solve for t because I know sine and cosine have a relationship called Pythagorean identities. Therefore, if I square that one and I square that one, that should become equal to 1. x minus 1 squared over a 4 plus y minus a 2 squared over a 4 equal to 1. And if I multiply both sides by 4, the 4 and 4 cancel, the 4 go here. Oh, as long as these coefficients are the same, it's going to be a circle. And if the number you're adding is 0, that represents the center of a circle. If it's 0, your circle is at 0, 0. The center is at 0, 0. But if it's a number, it's going to be the center at 1 and a 2 here. And 1 and a 2. And see, that's a positive. And that's the reason they said, okay, when it's negative, you change it to a positive. When it's a negative, you change it to a positive. And when it's a negative, you change it to a positive because you have to move it to the other side. But somebody said, not all the circular paths is circle. Maybe my circle of is an ellipse. That's right. That's right. Only as we spoke in conic section, the coefficient of cosine and sine should not be the same. Because if I solve for cosine of t, it becomes x over 3. And if I solve for sine of t, it becomes y over 4. And when I squared cosine squared plus sine squared equal to 1, you have x squared over 9 plus y squared over 16 equal to a 1. But somebody said, sir, I don't want your ellipse center at 0, 0. I want it at 1 and a negative 2. Then you have to move your 1 to other side, and it becomes x minus 1 squared over 9 plus y plus 2 squared over 16 equal to 1. That becomes an equation of ellipse, but the center is not at 0, 0. Okay, we talk about linear paths. We talk about a circular path. But somebody said, let's talk about a projectile path. Okay, you do know your X movement, just as we spoke here a few seconds ago, is a horizontal line, right there. And the horizontal line, we said, X is going to have a number, and your Y is always going to be zero. Therefore, here, X is going to become A, T, plus a 2 or a B, that's the constant. But what is that A? And number 2, what is my B? On a projectile motion, in no matter where the quarterback is standing and he's trying to go ahead and send the ball to the receiver, it could be 5 feet away from the y-axis or 3 feet to the left of x-axis. It doesn't matter where quarterback is. You don't have to move the quarterback, but you can move the y-axis exactly where the quarterback is standing. Or wherever you're going to use your shoulder to air missiles, you can stand on the y-axis. Therefore, since we said we're going to stay on the y-axis, and in here your x is 0, 
Therefore, equation of a line for, equa for the x of t is going to become a times t. And a is going to become your slope. Like 2, 3, when t is 1. And for example, if a is 2. When t is 0, you are 0. When it's 1, you are 2 feet away. When it's 2, it's 4 feet away. But what is your y value? I have an issue with y. First, you have initial height. Somebody said, what happened if I go under the ground and put, sh and put my shoulder to air missile? I can move my x-axis right here. Therefore, you always want to have your initial height is either 0 or a positive number. I'm going to call it h. <sighs> okay. I got it, but this h, you are adding some distance to it at every given time. Where that distance coming from? That distance coming from that initial velocity. That's called initial force. This is become v sub zero, and it depend quarterback. That initial force is gonna increase. It depend how relaxed the quarterback is. Sometimes quarterback like to throw the angle, uh, throw the ball at the thirty degree angle. Sometimes forty five degree angle. You know, sometimes quarterback they kind of do it, or uh, even a baseball they call it a low pitch or a high pitch. I don't remember. I don't know those terminology, but I have heard of it in TV. Therefore, that angle is very important. Therefore, if your hypotenuse is the initial velocity and this angle is theta, I exactly know how much of the initial velocity going to move my object on the horizontal distance. Therefore, I can tell the cosine of theta is x over v sub 0 and x equal to v sub 0 cosine theta. And this is nothing except your A. That's your A. Therefore, your X of T is going to become initial velocity cosine of theta. That's your slope times a T. And you do know the initial velocity is going to be a number. The cosine of an angle is going to be a number. Therefore, this is going to be a scalar quantity and times t. Therefore, you can consider this one as a slope. But how much of the initial velocity apply for the ball to go up? Oh, here I have to say sine of theta equal to y over the hypotenuse. No, no. Sine of theta is opposite over the hypotenuse. <laughs> That's right. For a minute, I get confused. Then what is your y? Your y is initial velocity times sine of a theta. Therefore, this is the slope for your y value. Because this is a graph of a quadratic equation. Quadratic equation is ax squared plus bx plus c. That c is initial height. That B right here is exactly your slope. Therefore, if I consider this one my H, and I consider this one V sub 0 sine of theta, but remember, I cannot write it as a function of X. I have to write it in a parametric function. I'm going to call it a T. And what is this? This is your gravitational force because your gravity is 32 feet per second square or your gravity is 9.8 feet, uh, I'm sorry, meter per second square. Therefore, what I need here, because I'm talking about distance, distance, this initial height is a distance, you are adding a distance to the initial height, another, but something is pushing your distance down. Therefore, that's called a subtraction. Two going up, one going down. Therefore, you have three distance. H, V sub zero sine of theta T, 
both of them move the ball up, something is pushing it down. And that's something, whatever the answer is, it had to become feet, because these are feet. Therefore, I know gravity is part of these, and gravity is feet per second square. I have to have something to kill that second square, therefore I put T square here. Therefore, if this is second square, the second square and second square cancel. And if you remember, the formula is one half G of T. And I'm sure when you go to calculus three, they're going to prove it for you. Therefore, this is feet per second square times second square, second square, second square is gone. Therefore, on projectile motion, you have your y value as a function of t, which is negative one half g t square plus v sub zero sine of theta t plus h, or sometimes they call this one y sub zero. That's one pair of the function for projectile motion. The other one was your x, and your x was v sub zero cosine theta times t. And remember your range, the distance your ball travel, is a linear distance. A, do you see that? That's a linear distance. Therefore, that the slope is always constant throughout here. We talk about three paths. Projectile. We talk about circular paths. And we talk about linear path. There is another path which is very important. They call it cycloid. I hope you know like a cardioid. Cardioid, card means heart. Oid means shape. This is called the shape of the heart and we call it cardiology. Therefore, cycloid is a shape of a cycle. Therefore, if you have a 25 cents coin and put the 25 cents coin in here, this is a ground. The coin never gonna go underground. You always stay on top of the ground and this is called a cycloid. Then I would like to know what is the parametric function to represent the cycloid. And let's see if we can create that formula. I'm going to take that coin and I'm going to say few minutes later the coin is here. I don't know what the radius of the coin is, but I'm going to call it A because some people do not roll, do not like to roll a coin. They like to roll a hula hoop or a tire of a car or a tire of a tractor. Therefore, when I roll, that's how my roll is going to look like. Therefore, you know, this is nothing except your circumference. This is exactly your circumference, which is 2 pi r, but in here I call my r a, therefore your circumference is 2 pi times a. And middle of it is half a circumference, therefore that length right here is pi times a. But let me ask you a favor. From here to here is a half a circumference. Then the horizontal distance in here is your diameter. Therefore, distance from here to here is a diameter, and diameter is twice as much as the radius. And this is exactly your diameter. See right here? Therefore, your y value is 2 times a. And if I pick a point right here and call that point X and a Y, the amount of rotation right here is right here. And that amount of rotation is more than 90 degree and is less than 180 degree. Therefore, this is called the reference angle for that angle. And if I call this point right here, 
my x and a y, I do have a triangle right here. Therefore, I'm going to graph it like I here and did it really, really straight. I had this, I had that. This is your angle, which if I call this one, if I call this one a theta, this is pi minus a theta. And if this point is on the circle and this is x and a y, I do have a circle, a tri triangle here. This is nothing except the radius because this is going to be exactly the center of my coin. Therefore, this is nothing except your A. And this line and this line are parallel. This angle and this angle are the same. Then this, if this angle and this angle are the same, this angle and that angle is 180 degree. Then if I want to find the cosine of that angle, the cosine of pi minus a, I have to write cosine of pi cosine a plus sine of pi sine a. And since sine of pi is zero, this goes away. And in here is a negative one. Then the cosine, because it's in the second quadrant, you have a negative value. But the sine is in the second quadrant, and the sine is sine of pi cosine a minus sine of a cosine of pi. This is zero. Make this one a zero. Cosine of pi is negative one. Negative times negative is a positive. But your sine of pi minus a is exactly equal to sine of a. You know this one from pre-calculus, but right now I want to ask you, I want to ask you, what is the cosine of that theta? Because remember, we call this one right here theta, and this one is nothing except pi minus a theta, because that's 180 degrees. That, I should have said pi minus a theta. I don't know why I put my radius right here. These are, should be all theta. Uh, please forgive me. It's bad to make a video without preparation. Therefore, the cosine of theta right here is a Jensen over the hypotenuse. Then let me call this point right here a B. Let me call this point an A. Then I bet you the cosine is A, B over A. And my AB is A cosine theta. What is your AB? <coughs> your AB is right here. And I know this is the radius of a circle. Therefore, your Y value is right here. And what is your Y value? Your Y value is going to be a function of theta. It's not a function of T. Is going to be from here to here, which is your radius, plus that distance, which is A cosine theta. I got my Y as a function of theta. I need my cos my X. What is my X? My X at that point is this distance right here. If I consider this one 0, 0. I need that distance. Therefore, I'm going to call this one a D. This point right here, I'm going to call it a B. And I'm going to call that point an F. Therefore, the X is this distance minus that distance. But what is that distance right here? That distance was right here was middle of the what? The graph and that cosine right there is going to become A times, remember, we are not, okay, let me see this one. We are talking about that distance. That distance is right here. This is the arc length, and the arc length is R times theta, 
And what is your R? Is A times theta. Therefore, that this, not that distance, not, not, I'm not in the middle, I'm right here. Therefore, that distance from here to here is A theta. And how much is, how much is that distance? I got to subtract that distance from it. Let me do my graph that you can see it a little bit better. Okay. This is my one cycle. This is the half a circumference. If I take my uh, radius A, and I'm going to put my coin right here. This is the center. This is A. And this is how much I rotate. Therefore, that distance right here is this not the same as pi A. That distance is this arc length. And that arc length is equal to R times theta. That's the formula for arc length. Your I is A, A times theta. Therefore, that distance is A times theta. But I'm talking about that distance. I'm talking about X value of that point. I shouldn't connect it to here. I'm talking about that one. I got to subtract that. And we said this is theta. Cosine theta is opposite, which my opposite was BD. Because we call this one a D, we call this one a B. Over the hypotenuse, which was the radius. And your BD is A cosine theta. Therefore, that distance right here, which is that distance right here, is right here. Therefore, I have to take all of these minus that one. It gives me the X value. Then what is my X as a function of theta? Is A theta minus A cosine theta. And I can factor the A, which is a radius, and say theta minus cosine theta. Let me make sure, let me make sure, let me make sure I did it right. This side is opposite to that angle. And I don't know why I use cosine. Cosine uses a Jensen. Therefore, in here, I have to say sine of theta. Sine is opposite over the hypotenuse. This is a sine. And this one is a sine. And this is a sine. Therefore, you have x of theta equal to a theta minus a sine theta. And if I factor a, you have theta minus sine theta. And what was y of theta? My y was this one, which is a plus that distance. That distance, I use cosine. And I said cosine theta equal to a Jensen, if I call that point a H, HB over A, and your HB is A cosine theta. But please remember, your theta is in the second quadrant, and if you remember, the cosine was negative cosine theta because your angle is bigger than 180 degree. Therefore, in here, I have to say HB is negative A cosine theta. Then tell me what is my Y? My Y is A minus A cosine theta. A minus A cosine theta. Therefore, this is your Y value, and this one is your X value. Okay. Somebody said that... Uh, let me make sure. Yes. Somebody said, would you give it a try? I said, yes, I give it a try for you. And I'm going to finish the video. That was a long video. I'm going to go right here, but I'm going to go to parametric function. And I'm going to say, what was my x? My x is a times theta minus sine theta. 
and in here I'm gonna place uh, A. You gotta give me some number for my radius. I'm gonna call my radius a two. Okay. Right now I don't know the angle instead of, and, I don't, and this is a parametric function. Parametric function, you cannot put a theta. Instead of a theta, you have to call it a radian t minus sine of t. And the y value was your radius, which is 2 minus 2 cosine of t. Okay, please keep your finger crossed. And somebody said, do I have, to, can I factor these two here? You don't even have to factor the two on the top. But let's go in here and say, what is your T? T is your angle. If I go from zero to two pi, make sure my mode is in the radian. Where is my mode? Make sure, make sure in the real number is in the radian. And uh, I go from zero to two pi, one cycle with the increment of 15 degree. 15 degree is pi divided by 12. The X mean, Remember, the circumference was 2. Therefore, what is, uh, I'm sorry, the radius was 2. What is the circumference? 2 pi r. The 2 times 3 is 6. 6 times uh, 2 is 12. I'm going to make it 36 or 40. I can go a few round. X mean is 0 to 40. But your y is your diameter and the scale 4. Diameter was only 2. 2 plus 2 is a 4. But I go from negative 1 to 5. Keep your finger crossed. I hope we did it right. Oh, my God. The cyclone is right. But it stopped. Because I only give it 2 pi. What happens if I give it uh, 3 cycles, 6 pi? See? You got 3 of them. That is the graph of a cycloid, and the graph of a cycloid can be done using parametric function. Therefore, tonight we talk about four paths, linear path, projectile path, circular path, and cycloid path. I hope you enjoyed this lesson.